This is a production of Cornell University. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's Jason, and I am the coordinator for the Insect Diagnostic Lab and the collection manager for the Cornell University Insect Collection. Uh, so the two jobs wrapped into one. Uh, what I'll do over the next uh, little while is, is discuss some of the things that I've been getting uh, over the past few months in here um, that might be of interest to you. And then I'm, I'm very keen to hear what you've been getting, um, and I'd be keen to get any questions that you might have. Uh, so don't be shy. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I get a lot of really good questions um, from people that submit things. So I guess the first thing that, that comes to mind for me, it's very fresh in my mind, um, is hemlock woolly adelgid, which I'm sure many of you have been experiencing. It just finally spread to my yard a few days ago, or at least I noticed it a few days ago. Um, and I, I live in a neighborhood where the Neighborhood Association sent out a, a strongly worded email um, warning against treating your trees for hemlock adelgid. Um, and one of my concerned neighbors thought it was a little sketchy that they were so strongly against it. And yeah, I, I did a fact check on it and it just didn't stand up on many levels. Um, but I, you know, I respect people's right to treat or not treat. Uh, my neighbor and I share two hemlock trees and we've we chatted over a barbecue last night that we will treat them um, and that the the cost benefit analysis sort of uh, strongly uh, weighs in favor of of treating them um, probably with amatocloprid um, or some other uh, neonic. Uh, has anybody else been seeing um, hemlock woolly adelgid uh, in their counties recently? This is Joyce from Duchess. We've had it for years um, because, especially along the Hudson River where it's warmer, was where we first saw a lot of damage on some of the stately old hemlocks along um, with some of the um, historical sites. It's come out throughout the county, and about every third year there's another article. And one thing I would like to say is when the article came out last year, an elderly couple came in, and they were almost ready to weep that they had this wonderful hedge, and it was going to be destroyed, and what would they do? And I took them outside to the hemlocks that are here at our farm and home center, and we've had hemlock woolly adelgid for five, ten years. It's weakened the tree, but I was able to show them what to look for and ask them to go scout before they hired someone to spray. So if it's new to your area, I would say that people shouldn't overreact and they should understand what it is they're looking for and understand that it doesn't necessarily kill the things overnight. In my uh, thank, Thanks, Joyce. I, I'm really keen to hear what the mortality is like in certain areas. Um, now, the two trees that we are going to treat are pretty weakened to start with. Um, they might not even be worth saving. It's debatable. Um, but do you see um, much mortality at all? Like, if you had to give a rough percentage, what would you say? What would you say? Um, I, what we what we see is they thin over several years and get to the point where they're starting to look ratty enough that people take them down. The ones here at our building, because it's a county building, they're, they're quite thin with maybe a third of the tops gone, and the bottoms are still green enough that no one has deemed them to be worthy of damage, you know, that they're going to fall down or at the, at the risk of causing damage. Okay. Thank you. And Jason, here as a, as a hiker and a, and a person who frequents trout streams, I'm seeing a lot of mortality on these big old beautiful hemlock forests on the north slopes in, in, uh, in these kind of, you know, more um, untended areas. And so they go. They do die. Okay. And, yeah. No. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. I'm 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 really quite curious to see sort of where the hemlocks are dying. And, and as as I think you guys have mentioned, uh, I suspect it's not 100% mortality. Um, and you know, I guess sort of as we're experiencing with things like beech bark disease, we're going to eventually select for more tolerant genotypes uh, that will survive uh, the outbreak. Um, and it, it is. It is sad to see some of these really old stately hemlocks go, um, and I'm just 
curious to see what the potential introduction of natural enemies will eventually do to it. Um, for those of you who are unaware, uh, there's a small beetle called Laracobius um, that's been introduced that loves hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and there's also a little chamomile fly that we're looking at introducing. The interesting thing with the chamomile fly, uh, it's not been recorded for New York State, but we do have specimens in the collection from Pennsylvania, so it's pretty close by. So uh, it's more of a, a jurisdictional thing that we have to seek permission to bring it into New York State, even though it probably does already occur here. It's just our knowledge of smaller flies is pretty sparse. Um, now, I was going to, unless there's further questions about hemlock woolly adelgid, um, there is a comment uh, about winter cutworms. And I was quite fascinated um, by that because um, most of you probably have realized uh, a fairly recent invasive here called Noctua pernuba. The common name, unfortunately, is the large yellow underwing. It's not related to any of our native underwings. It is a type of cutworm, but it's got bright orange hindwings with a black border. Uh, the forewing is quite variable in pattern. It can be from a dull orangish brown to a mottled, uh, darker brownish, almost black. Um, that species was introduced into Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, that would have been, I think, in the 70s. And it sort of sat in Nova Scotia, as, as a number of invasives have. Uh, and then, for some reason or another, just boomed westward. Um, and then in the early 1990s, it showed up in Ontario. Um, I, that's where I was collecting moths when I was younger. Um, and it just became abundant immediately. And then within a few years, I think by the year 2000, it had made it right to the Pacific coast. Um, I've heard from people that were doing uh, experiments here at Cornell that the year that species showed up, it just wiped out uh, various experiments. Uh, it's just a standard cutworm, just like some of our other uh, pest species. Um, but they're quite noticeable in that the larvae are sometimes active midwinter. If you get a, a bout of warm weather or about a freezing rain or something like that, they seem to come out and march around. Now, they can be separated from similar cutworms that are native uh, by they're usually a little bit bigger um, overall. That's sort of hard to judge, though. But the, the key character to look at is the markings along the side of the body. You're going to see a series of black rectangles that go from about um, a third of the way back right to the very end. Um, and those uh, black rectangles are quite prominent. They're the only really distinct marking. And if you've got that, you've got Noctua pernuba. I just wanted to verify, was that the winter cutworm you were talking about? Yeah, this was Joyce, and um, because my focus is um, is consumer, I had a woman call and said, my my beagles are eating these cat, these caterpillars. No, she called them cutworms, and they're throwing up. What are they, and are they poisonous? So I'm going in my little diagnostic lab and looking them up, and she sent she actually had she brought in the um, the samples, and they were fast little buggers once they got warm. It was in January, and I finally emerged all happy, and I went down to our agriculture colleagues who said, oh, yeah, that's winter cutworm. So they knew it from a, a crop um, pest, and I had to figure it out by myself, but it was because it was in someone's lawn, and the dogs were um, eating it, and I did find a University of Michigan article from several years ago. I think they're just so active it causes the dogs to throw up. So that's how I learned about the winter cutworm. Interesting. And I really like that common name. Uh, as you probably know with insects, common names, unless it's a major pest species, are next to useless. Uh, they exactly. vary from place to place. And I like that name because it actually makes sense because it is a type of cutworm. Um, and they're most prominent winter. You can find them sort of pretty much any month of the year. Uh, they're multi-volting here. They have several generations a year. But the winter, they just really stick out like a sore thumb. Um, yep. Um, that's really interesting, and I, I do wonder if they're chemically protected. They might be, um, but I suspect they're probably not. Um, I get a lot of queries here uh, in the diagnostic lab from uh, a few different organic producers, um, so they or especially distributors, where they buy organic produce, they distribute it, uh, it's sold, a customer finds a bug in their salad, and they complain, um, and sometimes threaten to sue. And the question that the distributor wants to know, well, there's three questions they want to know. First question is, what is it? Second question is, where is it from? And third question is, how dangerous is it? And the first answer 
uh, it varies if they can send me something or not. Usually it's a grainy cell phone pic of a black speck that may or may not be an insect. Um, if they send me a specimen, usually you can get some sort of name on it. Uh, the second question, where is it from? Unfortunately, the answer almost always is wherever that crop is grown, because a lot of these pests are pretty widespread. Uh, and the third answer um, that I say sort of semi-sarcastically is choice edible. Uh, most of these crop pests are perfectly edible, and you're unlikely to die if you consume it. Uh, there's been a few where it's like, okay, yeah, that will make your stomach upset if you eat it. However, as soon as your tongue hits it, it's going to realize that tastes really bad. Um, and it, it's it's sort of amazing to me how some consumers just overreact to a bug in their salad. Um, and, and I think it's really unfortunate. And we really need to uh, educate people that, you know, it's it's meat, you know. <laughs> if you're, as long as you're not vegetarian or vegan, you know, um, it shouldn't be a huge issue. You just either throw the salad out or and get a refund or, you know, just ignore it kind of thing. Um, not well, not uh, winter moth this year, or not winter moth. I don't mean that. Um, uh, winter cutworm, but we have we are now dealing with like the spring uh, emergence of things like stoneflies and and huge numbers. We have a lot of rivulets and streams and wet areas. And I had a pest pro come in yesterday with some stoneflies, and he um, the customer wanted him to spray the entire outside of his house to kill them all. And they were just, you know, resting on the yellow siding. So we do get that kind of, we don't know what it is. There's a lot of it. And shouldn't we just kill it? <laughs> uh, and yeah, sadly, as you can imagine, I deal with those as well. Um, two of the more memorable recent ones, uh, there was um, someone submitted springtails that were all over her deck uh, last year. And she wanted to know how to get rid of them. It's like, well, you could nuke your soil, but I really don't recommend it. You know, it's, they, they are a natural part of your soil. You know, get used to it. Once it dries out, they'll, they'll be gone. But the, the most dramatic example was uh, a pest control company in New York City called me up and said, okay, listen, we're calling you up by, by request of, of our client. We don't really think there's any need to do anything. Uh, they sent me photos of it. What it was is the top floor of a skyscraper um, adjacent to Central Park that on the outsides of the windows that are not openable, there were ichneumon wasps and lots of them. Uh, and the people that were um, working in the top floor of that building wanted the building sprayed because there were wasps on the outside of the windows. Um, and it just it baffled me. I had a very interesting chat with the pest control operator and basically uh, – encouraged to give them literature on what these ichneumon wasps actually do um, and that they're not dangerous at all, especially since there's no way for the people to be even in contact with them. It, was just, it seems like the sight of them was, was just enough. So I think what I'll do, I'll open it up to uh, questions. Does anybody have any specific questions for me? What, this is Joyce. Talk to us about folks' experience with earthworms and or invasive earthworms. What's going on with that? So that's a, a really interesting topic, and I can't claim to be an expert on it, but it's a, a topic that, that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, in New York State, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, there are no native earthworms. Um, they were wiped out by the previous glacial period. They would have probably eventually made it back here. Um, the expansion rate for earthworms is typically about a meter or a yard a year, um, depending on the species. Um, we either on purpose or by accident have introduced a number of species of earthworms into New York State, um, originally from Europe um, and more recently several Asian species. Um, now, in the garden in general, uh, an earthworm is a great thing. You know, they're good decomposers, they build soils, fantastic. Um, there's some strong arguments that earthworms can be quite detrimental to certain forest systems. Um, and where I used to work up in Algonquin Park in Ontario, where, again, there's no native earthworms, you can actually see the expansion ring of where earthworms have been dropped in someone's bait bucket uh, on some of the lakes um, because there's a very limited settlement history there. There were no earthworms, and people have dumped bait buckets. And you can see a ring where the inside of the ring, the leaf litter lasts less than a season. After that, the leaf litter accumulates for about three years. Now, 
the effects of this is is it does change things. So first of all, when you get rid of the leaf litter, yes, you do have that nutrient pulse, but it also causes the soil to dry out in the later summer, which is a drier time of the year up there, um, which can dry out some of the, the soil organisms as well as some of the seedlings. It does also change over probably long periods of time the forest composition. So with that typical um, three-year duff layer up there, um, only really big seeds get established uh, or really um, uh, um, well-nourished seeds. So things like sugar maple and beech are the dominant trees. Other things like uh, eastern hemlock, yellow birch, uh, and eastern white pine either depend on disturbance, like small ground fires, or getting established on rocks and logs, as they commonly are up there. Um, so this is changing the composition to favor um, some of these smaller seeded trees. And also, uh, further south in southern Ontario, it's favoring things like ash, which now is being nailed by emerald ash borer. So it's, it's definitely having an impact there. In studies in Michigan, they're showing that certain types of batrichium, some of the, the grape ferns that are quite rare, are being negatively affected by it. They also depend on thick duff layers uh, of leaves to, to protect them from competition from other sort of smaller seeded plants. Um, so the effects depend on what habitat you're talking about, but definitely they are changing. My suspicion is that they're really changing the invertebrate composition of leaf litter in forest systems. Um, case in point that uh, before earthworms are here, probably the biggest macro decomposers of dead leaves on the forest floor were specific types of caterpillars. Uh, there's a whole group of caterpillars called herminiines, they're called leaf litter moths. They're still around, they're still fairly common, but they probably were the major decomposers, but they're not as efficient as earthworms. This kept a very complex intact habitat, lots of habitat for things like uh, ground beetles and other insects that live in the soil. So I suspect there's some huge effects now, as far as earthworms getting um, dispersed, they're very easy to disperse, uh, especially, you know, bringing soil and things like that. But uh, in studies done in northern Alberta, they found that you can find earthworms um, speckled uh, in, uh, along the distribution of logging roads, and that earthworm eggs really strongly adhere to the tread of truck tires. And so trucks are distributing them just by, the, just by driving from places with earthworms to places without. Uh, does that sort of um, answer your questions? This is oh Joyce, did, did you want to uh, answer? Yes, thank you. Because for the others listening, it is interesting when someone calls up and says uh, on a rainy day and says, "My lawn is moving. What do I do?" <laughs> right. Well, help your lawn. I don't know. It's earthworm. Well, um, go ahead. And you brought something up, Jason. And as as we are, we're talking to folks about creating backyard biodiversity and building habitat. Things like ground beetles that are great predators, you know, they're losing, they're kind of losing their habitat because of these worms. And, you know, understanding those beetles a little bit more and knowing what they like, I think that, you know, it's part of our, part of our messaging. How do you, how do you build a good habitat in your backyard? And it sounds like they need brushy kind of cover um, and loose debris that they can hide and, and hang out in. Um, and, and I think uh, there's, there's two points I want to make here um, that, that uh, discussion spurred. Uh, one is um, why you see earthworms crawling around on the surface of the ground on rainy days. Uh, I used to believe, uh, as do I think many other people, that it was because, oh, well, it's raining, they'll drown down there. That's actually not true. They actually can survive perfectly fine as long as the soil is not constantly saturated. They can do just fine. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I recall going for a hike uh, back in my undergrad and just pondering, how do earthworms cross streams? And then looking down as I was crossing a bridge and seeing earthworms on the bottom of this stream wiggling along. It's like, oh, okay, that's how they swim. Um, the real reason why they come out on really rainy days is most species use that as a time to mate and disperse. And so it's much more efficient to travel across the surface of the ground than underground. And because it's raining, it's moist enough that they're not going to get too desiccated being uh, above ground. So that's the main dispersal thing. Uh, the second thing was on ground beetles. And um, um, I'm sure most of you have seen them. If you want to see how common ground beetles are in an area, go out at night, get a headlamp, and just shine at the ground. 
they have really distinctive eye shines, two dots that will look right back at you. If you see six or eight dots, those are typically wolf spiders, also quite common at night. If you sample the uh, ground beetles, the crabids of your backyard, unfortunately what you'll find, unless you're out in a pristine wild area, is most of the dominant species are European in origin. Uh, they've really taken over, uh, especially in, in uh, disturbed habitats. Uh, and especially in agricultural habitats. Now, if you want to promote ground beetle diversity in your backyard, basically you need a place for them to hide. Most of the species that are there um, are nocturnal, and during the day they hide under logs and rocks. And what I always advise people, when I, especially when I do master gardener trainings, when I talk about how to um, promote having uh, beneficial insects in gardens like ground beetles is have a place for them to live. You know, surround your garden by things like cobblestones. Cobblestones are great. Any sort of rocks, any sort of debris that they can go under during the day is fantastic. And and the cool thing about that is for people that, that are really curious about what's there at night is you can lift those cobblestones up and have a look at all the things that hide there uh, during the day. And the majority of those things will be beneficial insects uh, or at least neutral. Now, some things like some of the cutworms will use that, but uh, on the balance, I'd say it's, it's generally beneficial to have places for things to hide. The number one enemy to a lot of these beneficial insects is just lawns. Um, lawns are just biodiversity deserts, really. Any comments or further questions on, the, on uh, that or something else? This is Joyce. I'm sorry to be noisy. I have a photo of the cutworm. If I could share, can someone give me the ball? Interesting. Um, you can see it? Yeah. Now, to me, that actually might not be Noctua pernuba. It's hard to tell. So it does have those rectangles, but they're just not quite right. That might be another one called Spilotus clandestina um, and the clandestine dart. Um, I'm sure it has another common name as well, which is a native species. I'd, I'd have to compare to the literature on that one. Yeah, um, when when I oh, wow. looked at them, um, yeah, when I looked at it, I threw it out, and then when I called her, I said, "Send me photos." So these are the only two photos I have. But <laughs> this is what her dog was eating. Wow. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to see. Cutworm identification can be challenging. Um, it's probably it not to a pernuba. Yeah, it's probably not to a pernuba. I, we have a lot of folks emailing us photos now. Um, we've gotten past the um, asking them to put the ants on the phone so that they can tell us what uh, who they are. So they're sending us photographs, um, and then we oh generally we always try to get them to follow up with a sample or stop by. Um, because I think that people are going more and more to the internet to just, um, you know, they're trolling, they're, go they're just finding everything, and then they're getting really confused, and, uh, you know, they've got this thing, and then when you look into it, it's, you know, only from South America, and, you know, are you, are you getting a lot of that, too? I mean, I, I, Jason, are you getting a lot of samples via photo? Uh, absolutely. Um, that's becoming, I've, I've been here for four years and I'd say even in that short time, it's, it's drastically increased. And I encourage people to submit photos because uh, quite often we can at least alleviate some of their fears. Um, one of the most common things people, you know, submit to the diagnostic lab is uh, they are worried about bed bugs. And so we'll send a photo of a dermestid and right away I can say, okay, no, that's not a bed bug. It's a dermestid. You could submit it. I can tell you what kind and where you might want to look for it kind of thing. Uh, I had an interesting question yesterday. I was giving a collection tour to a soils class and one of the students asked me, okay, so we have this lovely thing called the internet and Google. Why should people submit something to the diagnostic lab? And uh, my answer was quite similar to yours that, well, for some things, absolutely, you get a big showy butterfly, you can consult the internet and probably get a reasonable answer for it. Um, especially if you've got a, a background to entomology, you can sort of figure out or know the reputable websites. But you can find, there's, as you all know, there's so much garbage out there. Um, so, for instance, when someone submits springtails, I send them a little blur back on springtails and what to do, uh, you know, kind of thing. Um, but I always have to put the caveat, by the way, springtails do not breed under your skin. 
And if you Google springtails, unfortunately, you will find articles that say, yes, they do. You also find articles that say they're government conspiracies and that they're implanting fibers in your brain and controlling things. Now, granted, most people will sort of laugh at the last few, but there's a few that go down that route. And I spend a fair bit of time on the phone, um, especially in the winter, with people that have gone uh, you know, down the rabbit hole, and it can be really challenging to convince them that, well, A, I'm not part of the conspiracy, um, and B, that some of these websites are, you know, blowing hot air, that there's there's really nothing to it. Um, saying that I think it, it is really valuable, and, and for some people that submit stuff, I'm just surprised that they didn't Google it. Like, some of them are just so obvious. Um, like, if you had... Uh, let's say, a pest on your hibiscus. Uh, it's it's pretty easy to Google pest hibiscus, and there's a good chance you'll get a reasonable answer. Um, not always, but but usually. Um, and some just, you know, submit really distinctive things. And the ones that I find don't use the Googles and talk to me first uh, tend to be sort of on the older end of things and just not so internet savvy. Um, and some of the, the, the ones that... Um, are, are really susceptible to paranoia, tend to not even have email. Um, so I have to uh, talk to them either in person or, or on the phone. I'll have one more. With what seems to be an early spring, we here in the Hudson Valley have all sorts of things blooming and the Red Wings blackbirds are back. What do you think we will see? Will we see more activity, earlier activity? Um, what can we anticipate in terms of calls and, and um, oh, my goodness, what is this in terms of, of early spring? Oh, very difficult question. Um, so as you know, it's really hard to crystal ball these sort of things. Um, with an earlier season, what... I would guess is that certain migratory species that become pests, uh, things like uh, corn earworm, army worm, they might be able to get here earlier and uh, establish sooner. Um, now, the big years that we have for those typically correspond with really warm winters further south um, and ideal conditions for them that aren't too wet. Uh, and I think that's the case. So we may see more uh, larger numbers of that. Another one that sort of falls into this pattern is diamondback moth, where they're also generally migratory. There are some exceptional individuals that can overwinter um, further north. Like even in New York State, there are records of that. Um, but it's certainly not normal. This year might be different. We only had, at least here in Tompkins County, we only had a few quite cold days, but that might not have been cold enough to kill off things like diamondback moths. So it just sort of advances the season. They might be able to squeeze in another generation uh, and become more of a problem that way. Um, Otherwise, it really depends on how much moisture. Because the other thing that was quite striking about this winter, uh, at least here um, in in Tompkins County, is the very little snow that we got. um, And the cold snap seemed to really hit the ground quite hard. So you probably noticed a lot of needle ice this year. If you have bare patches of ground where you get these sharp uh, icy needles that pop up with soil capping them, that's basically uh, a condition you get when you've got no snow cover, a cold snap, and basically water through capillary action comes up for the soil and forms these needles. That's really quite damaging to a lot of insects that just overwinter in the leaf layer. Uh, In years where you have a lot of snow cover um, and the winter is not exceptionally cold, you actually have insects and especially spiders active all winter long underneath the snow. Um, And that certainly probably wasn't the case, at least during the cold days um, this winter, since there was essentially no snow up here. Um, So my long-winded answer, or the short version of my long-winded answer is, it's hard to say, but I suspect a few more pests will get an early head start this year. What is the forecast for black-legged ticks? Ah, um, black-legged ticks, um, also known as deer ticks. Um, I don't know. Um, I I found very few this winter. Like uh, in previous winters, uh, if I'd go out, I'd get a few on me even, uh, on warm days in the winter. Even if it was just slightly below freezing, you'd still get the odd tick. Uh, I've seen none this year. I know that's just an anecdote. I don't have any real data to support that. So I don't know. 
Um, I think the only way we'll find out is just by experiencing it. Um, I'm more familiar with some of the other tick species up north, and the big things that seem to knock them back um, were uh, the fall conditions. And I'm trying to remember back to what our fall was like. Um, the fall conditions being exceptionally cold and damp were not friendly to the ticks. If they were warm, dry falls, they seemed to do really well that winter. I suspect it's probably similar for black-legged ticks. I, my short answer is I don't know. Are there any um, any kind of hot pests that you hope you don't get any samples of but that we should be on the lookout for? <laughs> Uh, hot pests that we don't get samples out that we should be or of that we uh, should be looking out for. Um, there's quite a few um, bark beetles um, that have been showing up. Um, it's I went to a bark beetle workshop uh, two years ago in Florida, and it was disturbing how many new species show up every year, especially in the southeast, but also up here, um, and they can go undetected for many years. Um, so there's a number of bark beetles that I would worry about, but but quite frankly, at this point, we have so many non-native bark beetles here. It's it's um, except for for specific ones, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, down towards Long Island, um, southern pine beetle has seemed to spread north and is nailing a lot of the pines there. I don't know how far north that one will get. Um, that's really hard to predict. That, and w at least with the went western counterpart, the mountain pine beetle, it's really highly dependent on a lot of old trees um, and warm winters. And again, this is probably a fairly warm winter, so it, it might have spread a fit bit further north. I don't know how far north it will get, though. Um, as far as other things go... Um, I really don't know. Um, there is a new longhorn beetle that has shown up um, near New York City uh, in Westchester County. Um, and the unfortunate thing is it's so indistinctive that the way to key it out is it lacks all the distinctive features of all the other species. Um, and it's it's been well established in that yard, um, and I think it's probably going to spread. Now, is it going to be a pest on trees? Maybe. Uh, it seems most be emerging from firewood, um, but there is some evidence, at least in Utah, where it's established uh, that it can affect uh, fruit trees negatively. Um, beyond that, um, your guess is as good as mine. I really don't know, and I just need to be. We all need to be prepared for anything that's sort of new. And when I'm asked the question, okay, how do you prepare for the next invasive? And the thing I advise people is be familiar with what's in your backyard. And if something looks different, be suspicious because these new invasives that become a problem, they tend to show up and show up very drastically and suddenly. And so they'll stick out to, to a lot of people. Should we expect any negative impact to some of our garden beneficials due to the lack of snow cover? A good question. Um, I'd say probably yes and probably no. It all depends on the species. Uh, the thing with a really healthy garden, um, the beneficial insects should be diverse, um, both in uh, diversity of species and diversity of families and orders of insects. Uh, if you depend on one species, let's say one type of ground beetle, um, chances are some event will knock them all back. Uh, with this this weird winter where we had almost no snow cover, and when it got cold, there was no snow cover, it seemed, um, yeah, some of the things will be negatively affected. The thing with uh, a lot of our native species, though, is they are adapted to this for the most part. And yeah, some will get knocked back, some won't. Um, and insect populations will fluctuate. So that's my wishy-washy answer of maybe, maybe not, depending, somewhat, kind of. Can you highlight some of the, your um, preferred sites uh, for gathering some information on their own? So I'll point out a few things. So as Laurie mentioned, the Insect Diagnostic Lab, if you Google Insect Diagnostic Lab Cornell, you'll find us. Uh, we do have fact sheets um, for a lot of different insects. Um, so you can click on that, and there is, is information in a lot of different groups. Um, also, there's information uh, if people want to submit samples to us or you've got a client that wants to submit to us um, 
if it's a really difficult sample. Here's the information for it, how to send it. Uh, it's really key, uh, key to emphasize that I need the information on where it's from, when it's from kind of thing, uh, and also to package it appropriately. It's disturbing how many people it will put an insect, uh, wrap it up in a Kleenex, put it in an envelope and send it through the mail and expect me to piece together a thousand pieces of insect and try to identify it. Um, so always make sure they put it into some sort of crush proof container. So um, that's sort of the shameless self promotion aspect of it. Um, other than that, um, bug guide. Um, so bugguide.net, if you've never used this website, use it. It's fantastic. Um, my bias is I am one of the editors on this website. But basically what you can do, so if you, you're completely clueless, you have no idea what you can do, go to ID request. Um, you have to set up an account, it's free. Um, and you uh, basically add an image. You submit an image, and depending on what it is, it can be identified in a few minutes or sometimes a few years. It all depends. Um, but usually someone will move it to an appropriate place. How I use it a lot um, is if you go to the guide, uh, you can pick your, your insect group. Um, let's see, insects. Uh, be let's pick beetles for now. Um, you can go to taxonomy, pick the family that you want. Um, let's say you've got some sort of scarab beetle and you want help identifying it. You can go to images, and I'll just show you general images. But if you go to browse, it shows you the different subfamilies, so you can quickly browse it. Let's say, okay, I think I've got an aphodiaine uh, dung beetle. Okay, it narrows it down further. You can click on that and go right down to species. And for each species, you know, there'll be an, ins uh, an image, uh, the info for it, and some of them will have elaborate information on, on it. Um, and sort of habitat stuff, some will have a lot more information. Some will have links, and this is where it gets really useful. You can see the links where you can get more information for proper identification. So if you went to uh, Fodiines, you'll see that link is, is the really good one to identify things to genera and then to species, it depends. Um, also for each species, so you can also Google, let's say um, you've got something on Fraxinus caterpillar. This sometimes can work. And so it gives you some of these images. Let's see, you go to this one. Okay, yeah, it kind of looks like that. Look at the range, so where they've got specimens from. Ah, it's an eastern thing, it's in New York. Okay, that's reasonable. Here's the, the time you see it um, sort of thing. So this is, um, I think, one of the most useful resources um, for it. Um, not just uh, that, but it also will link to other useful resources. So for this particular species, here's a link to Moth Photographer's Group, which has information, another website. So several websites that have um, further information. Um, so basically, beyond that, start with Bug Guide, and it will. If it doesn't have the answer, it'll link you to the answer. And of course, you can always uh, submit to the Insect Diagnostic Lab. Um, as a general rule for um, people related to the CCE, uh, if uh, you don't want to pay the twenty-five dollars, if you just want a yes or no answer, I will do that for free. Um, but for a what is this answer, um, I'll, I do charge for that. Um, as long as the, if you're expecting yes or no answer, if if maybe is an acceptable answer, then again, yeah, I can I can usually do this for free, and um, especially if it's something uh, rather quick like that. Um, and you can find my contact info through the Insect Diagnostic Lab or just Google me. I'm always keen to hear what um, uh, various educators get in uh, other counties because for a lot of the things that are easier to identify. I just, I never hear about it. Um, they just don't come across to, to me very often. So uh, thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.